This is a very important story. The important story. In the midst of COVID-19, it's an historic opportunity to look at the facts of the world as it is, and then to focus on the solutions to some of our greatest problems. In the 75 years since the United Nations was founded, the human race has never had to face a set of challenges like we do right now. But together, we can overcome them. It's a myth that each and every one of us doesn't have the ability to change the world dramatically and quickly. There have been enormous shifts in power and behavior to the benefit of all humanity, and it can happen again. Nelson Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it's done. These are some of the things that must be done. COVID-19 is the first major pandemic in six decades. Worst pandemics occurred in 1918, 1957, and 1968, when the population was exponentially smaller, and carbon emissions were not even on anyone's radar. Because pandemics have always occurred, there is no logical basis, not even a flimsy one, to infer that population growth, climate change, or industrialization caused this one. People may or may not agree with Schwab that Zoom meetings are preferable to in-person work, that sitting in the same house every day of the week is preferable to commuting to an office, that local entertainment is better than international travel, that exercise classes are just as good over the computer screen as they are in a studio. But there is one thing most people agree with, being told that germs threaten your existence when they really do not is abusive. Scaring people into their homes, making them fear their own family and friends, preying on their vulnerabilities, shattering their social existences, especially when you knowingly do this in hopes of making it permanent, is just about as bad as human behavior gets. Just as bad, Schwab and company know the lockdowns are taking out certain industries while sparing others. In a nutshell, the powerful survive. Anyone who has both this knowledge and the ability to influence lockdown duration has an unthinkable level of power and an unlimited ability to amass more of it by manipulating pretty much the entire global financial system. All of this is eminently predictable by the people encouraging, supporting, and imposing the restrictive orders. The restaurant sector of activity has been hit by the pandemic lockdown to such a dramatic extent that it may never come back. In France and the UK, several industry voices estimate that up to 75% of independent restaurants might not survive the lockdowns and subsequent social distancing measures. The large chains and fast food giants will. This in turn suggests that big business will get bigger while the smallest shrink or disappear. A large restaurant chain, for example, has a better chance of staying operational as it benefits from more resources and ultimately less competition in the wake of bankruptcies among smaller outfits. Now, when we look at COVID, I think we should um, distinguish between three phases. We have the three R's. Restrain, which means to fight the virus, the hot phase most countries are in today. Then we have recover, to go back to a kind of new normal. And finally, the reset which means to define and to design the strategies um, which uh, should lead us uh, in the after-corona phase. Um, what is the objective? What kind of world do we want to build? What do we know? What did we learn? 
I think the world um, which uh, we want to create with the Great Reset has to be much more resilient. It has to be because security people will demand for more security, um, physical security, health security. It will have to be more inclusive. Uh, we had already a big gap um, before the crisis started. This gap will be tremendously increased. So if we want to avoid uh, some kind of uh, social revolutions, and we have seen uh, the signs of anger on the streets uh, already the last weeks. Um, so we have to address um, this issue to create a stronger inclusiveness. And finally, um, more sustainable, because um, uh, we know now uh, that um, the next crisis is already waiting for us around the corner, and it is the climate crisis. Knowingly taking out small business, one of the last bastions of free speech and independence, distinguishable from the tightly controlled corporate world, is evil. It is hard to believe that anyone would do it if they could avoid it. However, it is equally hard to ignore the fact that Florida, Georgia, South Dakota, Texas, and Sweden, among many others, have fully open economies and average mortality to show for it. Both public health ethics and the Syracuse principles dictate that the least restrictive means must be used when public health is given as a justification for restricting basic human rights, such as the right to earn a living. Yet Schwab and Fauci both ignore Sweden and Florida and claim that COVID-19 lockdown restrictions must continue until 2022 or longer. How on earth do they justify it? They seem to be telling themselves and may even truly believe that they are saving the planet so the ends justify the means. In his book, Schwab poses the rhetorical question, is it okay to lie to the public for some greater good? Well, I would respond, who should we trust to decide what is the greater good? There will never be unified agreement on which system achieves this end. Some will vote Milton Friedman, some Klaus Schwab. Most everyone, however, would agree that tricks like exploiting pandemics should not be used even by one's own side. Reasonable people may well believe in the merit of Schwab's stakeholder economy, but they undoubtedly expect to be persuaded of its merit, not to have the system foisted on them by ruse. We need a new way of thinking on climate, on inequality, on health, because the way we're doing things just isn't working well enough. The world is in crisis. And not just because of the last few months, not just because of COVID-19, but because of the last few decades and because of us. The democratic process exists so ideas can be openly hashed out, debated and settled by the public. Each person allotted one vote. If we can't persuade the public that it's desirable to do these things, we have no right to impose them even if we had the power to do it. Schwab quite openly admits that he would like to dispense with this process. It is not producing the results he desires. Far from it, recent populist movements in the US, Make America Great Again, and the UK, Brexit, have specifically rejected his collectivist ideals. Without greater collaboration, we will be unable to address the global challenges that we collectively face. Put in the simplest possible terms, if as human beings we do not collaborate to confront our existential challenges, the environment and the global governance freefall, among others, we are doomed. In his Great Reset marketing book, Schwab threatens that the rising tide of nationalism will prove incompatible with the United States dollar status as global reserve currency. He suggests that an alternative currency will be needed, that a global digital currency is eventually going to arrive, and that China is years ahead of the rest of the world in developing one. 
Huang Dan just paid with a new type of money at this pharmacy. Oh, uh, uh, uh. That's because China's paper cash is going digital. The digital yuan is meant to be faster than using credit or debit cards on digital wallets like Apple Pay. Plus, there are other incentives, like zero transaction fees for merchants, and one day it'll even work offline. But one major difference is that the digital yuan is 100% trackable by China's central bank. And when it's launched nationwide, it could impact not only citizens, but also foreign companies operating in the country. This makes the WEF annual meeting a cost-effective brainstorming event, which I would like to call Schwab Economics. Although he doesn't say so directly, Schwab undoubtedly dislikes what Trump had been doing to defend the dollar. The security premium enjoyed by the U.S. dollar could diminish because the U.S. is disengaging from global geopolitics in favor of more standalone, inward-looking policies. Predictably, Schwab makes the argument that these same nationalist policies proved disastrous during the pandemic. Echoing the WHO's praise of China's collectivist action in Wuhan, The global community is simply not yet ready in mindset or with the materials to implement the measures that have been employed, the only successful measures we know so far to contain COVID-19 as it has in, here in China. Which Xi Jinping proudly declares eradicated the virus from the entire nation of China. Schwab writes that countries fared better during the pandemic when they share a real sense of solidarity, favoring the common good over individual aspirations and needs. Support for these concepts is not a new feeling for Schwab. This did not spring organically out of the pandemic for him, like an epiphany. Rather, this is his long-held vision of utopia and his life's work. He's been talking about it for decades. We just had Copenhagen. We had uh, many other events in 2009, which clearly showed that the present system of global cooperation is not working sufficiently. One of the features of this fourth industrial revolution is that it doesn't change what we are doing, but it changes us. We need a different economic model. Just, just look to what happens in Davos. And, and just look to what happens on television. The agenda of Davos is taken uh, over by practically everybody, whether it is the uh, the television, the papers, the public debate. So what Klaus has established is an agenda-setting forum. COVID-19, if anything, has accelerated this ongoing industrial revolution. If COVID had happened even 10 years ago, we could not have imagined moving entire companies, schools and government offices so fast online. Today, that is a reality. The fourth industrial revolution has become a reality. Earlier this year, Schwab told the Financial Times that his aim has been to beat back Friedman. What was, for me, always disturbing was that Milton Friedman gave a moral reasoning to shareholder capitalism. He argued the role of business was to make business earn as much as possible, and then the money would flow back from the company to the government in the form of taxes. I had to fight against the wave. In short, Schwab and company are on a mission. The mission is to change society. They admire China's and New Zealand's governance. They practiced for a pandemic. Science has been thrown to the wind for months. Censorship is rampant. Sweden and Florida are ignored. The rule of law is suspended. And certain governors seem determined never to release us from their declared state of emergency. These circumstances are favorable to Schwab and his powerful allies, including technology companies, billionaires, the media, China, the UN, and others. They are detrimental to billions of less powerful, less organized people and small businesses. There is a lot we don't know because we aren't being told. Climate change is indeed, for me, the defining issue of our time. For the first time in the history of humankind, there is a limit 
a physical limit to our perspectives of development. And uh, this has led uh, humankind to declare a war to nature, and nature is striking back, uh, and striking back in a very violent way, as we have seen uh, in different parts of the world. Now, uh, it is absolutely essential to recognize that climate change is an existential threat to us all, and that climate change is running faster than what we are. We are not winning this war, and we absolutely must do it. This is not a time for pessimism. This is a time for optimism. Fear and doubt is not a good thought process, because this is a time for tremendous hope and joy and optimism and action. But to embrace the possibilities of tomorrow, we must reject the perennial prophets of doom and their predictions of the apocalypse. They are the heirs of yesterday's foolish fortune tellers, and I have them, and you have them, and we all have them. And they want to see us do badly, but we don't let that happen. They predicted an overpopulation crisis in the 1960s, mass starvation in the 70s, and an end of oil in the 1990s. These alarmists always demand the same thing, absolute power to dominate, transform, and control every aspect of our lives. We will never let radical socialists destroy our economy, wreck our country, or eradicate our liberty. America will always be the proud, strong, and unyielding bastion of freedom. In America, we understand what the pessimists refuse to see that a growing and vibrant market economy focused on the future lifts the human spirit and excites creativity strong enough to overcome any challenge, any challenge by far. Schwab and his ideologically aligned allies seem to think that they are saving the world. It is not conspiracy theory to read their own books and listen to their own words which target fundamental liberties and rights that the West has long taken for granted. At some point, it's not unreasonable to observe that this is no longer about public health. It's about a new political vision, one hatched by a private few in order to rule over the many. It is unlikely to be shared by most people, thus setting up what is likely to be an epic battle in the future. pandemic has provided an opportunity for a reset. This is our chance to accelerate our pre-pandemic efforts to reimagine economic systems that actually address global challenges like extreme poverty, inequality, and climate change. Building back better means getting support to the most vulnerable while maintaining our momentum on reaching the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the SDGs. But this moment also gives us a much greater chance to be radical and to do things differently, to build back better. As lockdowns have been enforced to slow the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been unexpected benefit. In the face of global challenges posed by climate change, air pollution, social and economic inequalities, and the ongoing pandemic, we have a chance to build back better. The WHO Manifesto for a Healthy and Green Recovery to COVID-19 provides a prescription for a better normal. Now is the time to rethink how we organize our societies. In order to meet the challenges today, we can't just build back the way things were before. We have to build back better. We cannot let this crisis become a lost opportunity. Humanity also faces the threat of climate catastrophe. The recovery plans must be sustainable, climate neutral and climate resilient. We must recover better. With 
transforming our economy to make it sustainable. We need to act together. To really build back better and to turn this tremendous challenge into a fabulous opportunity for our country. Canadians have done such a terrific job in fighting the coronavirus so far. I'm really, really proud of our country and I am absolutely confident that working together we can get through this and we can build back a country even better than the one we had before the pandemic hit us. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take one more question in the foyer here. Better. We will build back better from the COVID crisis. Better, stronger, with an answer to the many challenges New Zealand already faced. This is our opportunity. As the Prime Minister has said before, I mean, there is a health crisis, but that doesn't mean that the climate crisis is going away. We still have another crisis. It's called climate change. And also, you know, how do you build back better? Because of the COVID-19 and the need of, to recover our economies, we are spending trillions of dollars at the present moment. So if you are spending trillions of dollars, let's do it in line with the Sustainable Development Goals. Let's do it in line with the Agenda 2030. Let's uh, uh, rebuild our economies better. So the vice president took the approach of saying, we're not just going to try to plaster over the cracks and put some props in where it's falling apart. His approach was to say, we're going to build it back better. What have we learned? How do we improve? And how do we build back better? Some would say to build back, back better. We would say to really have a great reset. Thank you, Klaus, and thank you to the World Economic Forum.